We're talking about deception and how how on earth can society even come back from where we are today? Okay, because we're all looking at the end times and we're all thinking about the end times. And you know, since we came into the faith, everybody talks about the return of the Messiah on the clouds. And we think that this is some big, huge event that happens in a moment in time, but it boils up over a long period of time. And a lot of it has to do with intellectual uh, apostasy and not being able to even look and understand at what we are seeing, right? Not even like big things, like big angels on the clouds. Everybody's going to see that. But how is how is it that Satan is able to deceive the whole world. It's so Revelation 12, 7, 9. Right. There, there's war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels waged war, and they were not strong enough, and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil, and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. So, so how does the Satan deceive the whole world? How did he manage to deceive a third of the angels? Powerful. <laughs> Pretty powerful. Now, we know how slick he was in the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden, though, most of that falls on Eve falling to temptation. She was looking at it, at the fruit, and Satan comes along as slick as he is and just knocks her over the edge. the air. words of the eye, too. He did. He absolutely did. He saw that Eve was already attracted to the fruit. He nudged her over the edge, and voila, 6,000 years of sin. Now, that particular deception was just one method of deception, right? When people decide to be deceptive, there are many, many, many ways to go about it. Some people are big-time schemers, nations, corporations, individuals. Some people don't even know the truth. They don't even value it. It's not even part of their value system. Everything is is results based and outcome based so they just you know you know the ends justify the means type stuff well part of it is what's already in your heart that could be swayed with eve right yeah, which yeah. there's something in you that's allowing you to sway one way or another mm -hmm. but the truth is almost always black and white sometimes it takes us a while to get there though because we were raised everybody here i think was raised one way and now believes a different way. So we have gone through the process of unraveling, but I think it's harder today because we knew that there was a God and mm -hmm. he was just being worshiped on the wrong day at the wrong time in the wrong way. Now today there's another layer to that where people don't, they're, they're just secular, you know? So, so, um, Deception can be pretty easy. Now let's take a look at an example. Okay. And this is um, Joshua 9 with the Gibeonites. Right. So our elders and all the inhabitants of our country spoke to us, the Gibeonites talking, saying, take provisions in your hand for the journey and go to meet them and say to them, we are your servants. Now then make a covenant with us. This is our, our bread was warm when we took it for our provisions and our out of our houses on the day we left to come to you. And now behold, it's dried, become crumbled. The wineskins which we filled were new, and behold, they're torn. And these are clothes, our sandals are worn out because of the very long journey. So the men of Israel took some of their provisions. They did not ask for the counsel of Yahweh. And Joshua made peace with them and made a covenant with them to let them live. And the leaders of the congregation swore an oath to them. It came about at the end of three days after they made a covenant with them, that they heard they were neighbors and they were living in their land. Okay, now this is this is a straight up deception. These guys, these Gibeonites, figured out that Israel was going and destroying everybody. They didn't want to move. They couldn't withstand it. So they hatched a plan. They said, "Okay, let's pretend we're not from here. We take old stuff." And they and they went in, and it was a straightforward ploy. And it worked. They conned them, right? And if you think about it, it's kind of brave because they, the outcome of them not winning with the con would have been to get killed right then and there. 
So they kind of, they conned them and they got hoodwinked. Now we are on guard for this all the time today. I told you the part, the part about, about my dad, right? And all these people calling, knowing about my dad and knowing about his, um, his health insurance and knowing about his issues. And I'm pretty, I'm like, guard is up, right? I think I'm getting ripped off. I mean, if I won money today, there's no way they could give it to me, right? Because it calls, oh, Chris, you've won some money. You're, you've inherited money from a long lost person, right? It'd be like, I don't believe you, right? Show me the money. <laughs> Show me the money, right? And then they have, what are the three funky numbers on the back of your credit card? And we can get you the data. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so my daughter says, if you just give me those three numbers on your credit card, we'll give you all this money, right? Because that's that's the way we live in a very schemy place. Um, uh, and, and the point of the point of this is that we live in a world of absolute deception. And my dad is reliant on this health insurance, right? You know, unless you are a very wealthy individual, you can't afford one week of care in a hospital mm -hmm. right now. And he needs all of it. So I'm very terrified that he loses his stuff. And so we're, we're on guard for these kind of cons because they're so common today. But what about the religious con, right? False messiahs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Now, when we verse, we reference verses like this, we think it's a level playing field in our head. We think we think it's that that we're going to be able to not be deceived if we study enough, if we're sharp enough, right? Because because we think the con is like the Gibeonites with the Israelites, where they're all on a pretty level playing field, right? They were human, they were mortal, they weren't no superpowers involved. It just went with a con. But what's coming, great signs and wonders, is coming to that could deceive the very elect is a delusion so strong that it caused a third of the angels to fall. Right? That That's pretty bad. That's big. That's Who saw Yahweh and lived with him. Exactly. Exactly. When re and, and so we're thinking it's going to be identifiable. And I see it. You know, as I'm goofing off on social media all day, who do you think is going to be the, the mark of the beast? And who's going to be this guy? Who's going to be that guy? And it's like, yeah, I get it, man. I, you want to understand that. But when we talk about the two witnesses, what are the what are the two witnesses' jobs? Because everybody wants to find out who they are, right? Can we know who they are? My Bible, my, 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 my doesn't tell me who they are, right? But what if we're supposed to know what they do? Two witnesses do what? Convict people of breaking the Torah. If we're not breaking the Torah, do we care who the two witnesses are? No. Right? <laughs> so if you look at what they're doing rather than who they are, right? So, so that's the nuance of Satan, In right? Action. So, and these enormous scams today are executed against wealthy and connected people who even have lawyers are getting conned and scammed. Think about the uh, the FTX cryptocurrency. The guy, Sam, that guy conned Tom Brady out of money, right? He conned hun people with hundreds of millions of dollars and lawyers on retainer conned everyone. And so we're talking about in mortal terms, people get gone. Now I'm talking about eternity. And now it gets worse. And I don't, if you've seen this video of mine before, I apologize, but I really like showing this video. Okay. Mr. Besmianov was born in 1939 in a suburb of Moscow. He was the son of a high-ranking Soviet Army officer. He was educated in the elite schools inside the Soviet Union and became an expert in Indian culture and Indian languages. He had an outstanding career with Novosti, which was the, and still is, I should say, the press arm or the press agency of the Soviet Union. It turns out that this is also a front for the KGB. 
He escaped to the West in 1970 after becoming totally disgusted with the Soviet system, and he did this at great risk to his life. He certainly is one of the world's outstanding experts on the subject of Soviet propaganda and disinformation and active measures. Well, you spoke several times before about ideological subversion. That is a phrase that uh, I'm afraid some Americans don't fully understand. When uh, the Soviets use the phrase ideological subversion, what do they mean by it? Ideological subversion is, is the slow process which we call either ideological subversion or active measures, activne meropriyatia in the language of, of the KGB, or psychological warfare. What it basically means is to change the perception of reality of every American to such an extent that despite of the abundance of information, no one is able to come to sensible conclusions in the interests of defending themselves, their families, their community, and their country. It's a great brainwashing uh, process which goes very slow and it's divided in, in four basic stages. Uh, the first one being demoralization. It takes from 15 to 20 years to demoralize a nation. Why that many years? Because this is the minimum number of years which requires to uh, educate one generation of students in the country of, of, of your enemy, exposed to the ideology of the enemy. In other words, Marxism-Leninism ideology is being pumped into the soft heads of, of, of at least three generations of American students without being challenged or counterbalanced by the basic values of Americanism, American patriotism. The demoralization process in the United States is basically completed already. Uh, for the last 25 years, actually it's overfulfilled because uh, demoralization now reaches such areas where previously not even Comrade Andropov and, and all his experts would, would even dream of such a tremendous success. Most of it is done by Americans to Americans, thanks to lack of moral standards. As I mentioned before, uh, exposure to true information does not matter anymore. A person who was demoralized is unable to assess true information. The facts tell nothing to him. Uh, even if I shower him with information, with, with authentic proof, with documents, with pictures, even if I take him by force to the Soviet Union and show him concentration camp, he will refuse to believe it until he, he is going to receive a kick in, the, in his fat bottom. When a military boot crashes his balls, then he will understand, but not before that. That's the tragic of the situation of demoralization. The next stage is destabilization. This time, subverter does not care about your ideas and the patterns of your consumption. Whether you eat junk food and get fat and flabby, it doesn't matter anymore. This time, and it takes only from two to five years to destabilize a nation. Uh, it's, what, what matters is essentials, economy, foreign relations, defense systems. Uh, and you can see it quite clearly that in some areas, uh, in such sensitive areas as, as uh, defense and economy, uh, the uh, influence of Marxist-Leninist ideas in the United States is absolutely fantastic. I, I could never believe it 14 years ago when I landed uh, in this part of the world that the process will go that fast. Uh, the next stage, of course, is crisis. It, it, it may take only up to six weeks to, to bring a country to the verge of crisis. You can see it in, in Central America now. And after crisis, with a violent change of, of power, structure, and economy, you have so-called the period of normalization. It may last indefinitely. Normalization is a cynical expression borrowed from Soviet propaganda. When the Soviet tanks moved into Czechoslovakia in 68, Comrade Brezhnev said, now the situation in brotherly Czechoslovakia is normalized. This is what will happen in the United States if you allow all these schmucks to bring the country to crisis, to promise people all kind of goodies and the paradise on earth, uh, to, to destabilize your uh, economy, to eliminate the principle of free market competition, and to put a big brother government in Washington, D.C., with the benevolent dictators like Walter Mondale, who will promise lots of things, never mind whether the promises are fulfilled or not. Your leftists, 
in the United States, all these professors and all these beautiful civil rights defenders, they are instrumental in the process of the, of the uh, uh, subversion only to destabilize the nation. When their job is completed, they are, non, they are not needed anymore. They know too much. Some of them, when, when they get disillusioned, when they see that Marxist-Lenin has come to power, they, obviously they get offended. They think that they will come to power. That will never happen, of course. They will be lined up against the wall and shot. But they may turn into the most bitter enemies of Marxist-Leninists when they come to power. And that's what happened in Nicaragua. You remember most of these uh, former Marxist-Leninists were either put to prison or one of them split, and now he's working against Sandinistas. It happened in, in uh, uh, Grenada when Maurice Bishop was, he was already a Marxist. He was executed by, by a new Marxist who was more Marxist than this Marxist. Same happened in Afghanistan when uh, first there was Taraki, he was killed by Amin, then Amin was killed by Babrak Karman with the help of KGB. Same happened in, in Bangladesh when Mujibur Rahman, very pro-Soviet leftist, was assassinated by his own Marxist-Leninist military comrades. It's the same pattern everywhere. The, the time bomb is ticking, that every second, the disaster... So, I, I didn't show that because of the, the substance of it. I showed it to show, to illustrate that their method of taking over countries was deception. And that entire country poured money, resources, planning and plotting in undermining all the societies that they took over by confusing people on a, on a grand scale. What's right is wrong, what's wrong is right. And yes, and they introduced it. So mm -hmm. today we are fighting an invisible enemy mm -hmm. because the state of a country that we live in today was this was done to us by a country that doesn't even exist anymore. When that when the USSR fell, we won. But nobody called this off. This is on autopilot. We're still, these ideas and everything are now like uh, self-fulfilling, mm -hmm. right? There's no giant country ready to come and take us over. So, because that was their point. Their point was to infiltrate a society for, for 15 years, deceive them, until they fall apart, and then the Soviet Union could come in and take them over without killing anybody, right? But there's nobody to come take us over. So right. we're right. We're we're going to continue like this for for like infinity, right? So, but in the case of the of the Gibeonites, they had to quickly launch a plan to deceive Israel on a pretty level playing field, right? And they could have been found out pretty easily. They could have, and the Israelites should have asked Yahweh, right? They should have just said, hey, Yahweh, are these guys on the up and up? And it would have been over with. They didn't do that, right? Um, but when you think of the USSR, this was a, a country that had universities and budgets in order to deceive. That's how they took stuff over. What, what about with Satan? He's had 6,000 years of practice. I mean, we, I don't mean to make us hopeless, but I am trying to paint a picture of what we're up against. He's the deceiver. Obviously, when we called, uh, when Reagan called the USSR the evil empire, they are, they were, right? Because their entire crux of everything was lies upon lies upon lies. It takes 15 years to for ideological subversion to occur. We're 60 years out from that. We that's why you see people marching in the streets for the most ridiculous causes, right? That that you see people, gay people marching in favor of Islamic people. You 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 we are like how could that possibly happen? But to those people what they're doing makes sense. And we look like we're from Mars. Mm -hmm. So these deception here was in order to create discord inside of this civilization so that we fight amongst ourselves and don't and can't tell right from wrong. Right? So 
what happens when facts don't matter, right? When facts don't matter, how do you make decisions? And what are the facts? What are the facts? Mm -hmm. What is truth, right? What, what, how do you, what do you do? Because he said specifically, if you take and put real information in front of these people, they aren't going to react to it. How many of us have clubbed family members over the head with the fourth commandment? It just doesn't mean anything to them, right? Now, that's not from the USSR. And that's from the Sunday system. They've got these, these ideas that they believe, oh, Yeshua is our Sabbath. Oh, you don't have to do that one anymore. And you repeat it, repeat it, repeat it. What do they do? They teach it from the kids up, right? So this pattern of deception is, is very difficult to combat. And what happens if the majority of a population can't process accurate information? And the other thing is that now we have so much technology that can alter reality. There's AI, mm -hmm. there's the chat GPT. So even what's before our eyes may not even be true, and we don't have a way to find what's true mm -hmm. either. Yes, I, I saw a video this week of a guy saying something that we all hoped that the guy would say, right? Mm -hmm. He was just a, just a general politician dude, gave a speech, and what happened is exactly what you just said. All the comments, is this real? Did he really say that? We do not trust what we see with our own eyes because we cannot. The other problem with the AI and the, and the internet is it amplifies the bad, right? It amplifies the bad. When was the last time you went to the internet to look something up that was boring? He didn't, <laughs> right? We go to the internet. And, and it listens to you, so it knows what you're wanting to look up. So. Yeah, right. So, yeah, somebody was, I think it was talking to April last week, you know, and I'm like, what am I, what's up, what's the point of all this knowledge, right? Because what's the point of all this knowledge, right? And she she's like, well, look, when, when it all comes down and all we have, when the internet's down and all we have is we go back to real books and real knowledge, you're all we got, buddy, right? And I'm like, okay, thank you, right? I needed that. But that's, how do you tell the difference? Because uh, in another, you know, in another forum, they, they were saying, stop sending links to your websites. We want everybody to discuss here, right? Because they want to build up the, the internet traffic on their forum so more people come to it, right? But the problem with that is that if you have a guy like me or Everett or you ladies who've been doing this for a long time, Right. Over five years, you're a journeyman. Right. Over five years in this movement, studying the Bible, keeping the Sabbath, whatever you're that's journeyman. Right. Hours right there. Oh, you're, you're ready. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. you're new. But so then you end up arguing with people who just learned it. On an equal playing field. Right. Well, that's not that's not conducive to helping. Right. You should have some form of respect and leadership for the for people who've done it longer, right? But that's called elders. elders. That's why they're elders, is because they practice it yeah. for a while. And that's where um my friend Dan, if you were on uh, last uh, last uh last Friday night, my an old friend Dan DeFranco, uh, I ran into him on Twitter and he was raised in this. He's 47 years old. He's been in this movement his entire life. And he was having a discussion with people about the name of Yahweh who who just learned it. We know they just learned it because they're using the, the latest pronunciations. Yahuwah, Yahuwah. Yeah, right? Right? They don't even know that if you say Yahuwah, that means you just came to the truth, okay? And so they were arguing with them, and I just swooped in and said, hey, Dad, how's it been? How's it going, dude? And then I let it be known that they're talking to somebody who knows what he's talking about, right? That, you know, he's, he, I, we've known him for 20 years now. Right. And he's been preaching and going around and doing stuff. Nice, super nice guy. But, you know, I just let the other people know that, you know, he's should be respected without telling them, you know, you better respect this guy. Right. Mm -hmm. But, you know, he's he's somebody like that. But with Satan having over six thousand years to perfect his deception craft and a third of the angels at his 
disposal. You know, the Soviets were able to conquer about two, about 40% of the world with their deception. Right? What, what are we up against here? Right? Uh, it's pretty big. And um, what if the elect, is this another thing in Christian circles, is to say the elect are these super Christians who have all the answers, who know everything, right? But what if the elect are just people that can tell right from wrong, right? Because I don't think the bar is going to be as high. Now, for me, the bar is really high. Because he says, because he was talking to the Pharisees, and he says, because you know you sin, right? Because you say you know you sin. I do the studying. Those of us who do the studying, we have a high bar. We're more accountable. Oh, yeah. But the regular folk, uh, you know, the thief on the cross that obtained salvation, he didn't go to heaven, he obtained salvation, right? All he did was recognize injustice. That's it. And that he was the Messiah. That he was the Messiah. He said, this man is, you know, we're, we're guilty. We're getting our due punishment. But this man did nothing. And the reply is, I assure you this day you'll be with me in paradise. Mm -hmm. Right. That's, you know, you know, we don't want to set us ourselves up and say that that that's all a person has to do. Right. To be saved. But in reality, if you think about how deceived people are, yeah, just clinging to some kind of truth. Right. Might be might be a foundation. When the thief's situation, it was his last dying breath. Yeah. It's not like he went on for 20 years living a different life on earth after he recognized that. Right. So there's a different, right. everybody's on a different path and a different timeline. Right, right. Right. Exactly. Those of us yeah. who came to this in our life have, have to keep going one foot in front of the other. Yeah. So there's a book called Atlas Shrugged, which is, I'm coincidentally using this book with this comrade here. But Atlas Shrugged is a, was written by a lady who was in the Soviet Union when it fell or somewhere after that, defected, came to the U.S. and wrote this novel called Atlas Shrugs, humongous book, not religious by any stretch, right? Um, it, but, but one of the classics, if not like the top 10 books to read, per, well thought out. And she went through and said, what would happen if this happened to us? And how would, it, would the country go? And she goes in, in graphic detail and with all these well-developed characters about how people uh, couldn't tell the truth. They couldn't tell anything. And there were all kinds of uh, you know, stupid decisions made by the governments. And, and the, the country can't finally imploded. And, you know, and that's where it lived, died. But in part of this um, book, a recurring theme was... A phrase called check your premises, right? So the, there were wise people in the book who uh, who refused to participate. When they realized what was going on, they went and made their own little compound, and they hid it, and they stayed away. And there were smart people. And if they came out of their compound to do any work, they would only do manual work. They wouldn't do their trades and stuff like that. And one of the wise ones would say, check your premises, check your premises. So whenever you would see a piece of information that didn't make sense to you, that if something you held dear or some belief that you were sure of turned out not to be true, the phrase came up to being check your premises. Not, and my premises, I don't mean check the perimeter of your area. Your premises, meaning how are you looking at the information? Meaning you need to look introspectively, right? When you see truth and it is true, and it contradicts what you've been told, you're the one who has to make the change. The truth doesn't make a change. Mm -hmm. And that was the, the theme that had been going on forever and ever. Now, the, the problem was the material and the person's inability to recognize the truth. Those of us in this walk are unique because we were able to recognize the truth when we read it. We were taught, do this, Read the Bible. Oh, rats. <laughs> Part of that was the spirit guiding them, too. Yeah, I was building to that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The Holy Spirit's going to come in here in a little bit, too. But 
but that's that's where the checking your premises is is the first base, right? It is the Holy Spirit that pricks you to make you do it. Um, but we we haven't just just been taught things that aren't true in the West today because of this guy and his country. We've been taught to receive information improperly. We've been taught to put weight on things that don't deserve weight. We've been taught we're, we're a broken society. Take things at face value when they are first hear it. Mm -hmm. Internet's a big, a big part of that. It used to be if you got a book published, right, particularly nonfiction. Oh, somebody's chatting. I missed the video. What is his name? I cannot pronounce it. <laughs> <laughs> um, it uh, like the YouTube thing, maybe just copy and paste. Them. Yeah, I was going to say, can you put the link to that video in it's, the chat? It's embedded. You're so lame. Uh, but no, I do have it on our Rumble channel. It's in there uh, under KGB Defector. So yeah, I'll, I'll get it to you. I'll get because this is a good video, right? But. Um, but in Christianity, we were able to break free because in the Sunday system, we were taught wrong, and we just accepted it because they were authority figures. Well, it's half truth, so I think that's part of it too. Is you can once you you receive the whole truth, it's easier. I sh I shouldn't say easier. It was easy for us because we had the spirit of time to accept it. So if we were another religion, it might be harder to change. I think. Yes, yes, and and, and uh, um, but our society has been taught has improperly weighted things. Same thing with with books. Would you would you write, wrote books? Because I have real encyclopedias downstairs that I really like having them. In fact, since I've got them, I've used them twice, right? Um, uh, already, and and you couldn't get published. If you were a crackpot, okay, or if you were a crackpot and you got published, there was an asterisk inside the right. But today, with the way that the information flows so fast, right? I mean, if you think about the, the the shootings that happen in the news and how the news just runs with the narrative, and then it turns out to be wrong, and they have to claw it back. No fact check. Yeah, and so it's it's so fast now. That if you just hear a bit of information and you never hear the correction, you can walk around with wrong thinking for the rest of your days. And keep sharing. There's yeah, right. That's it. Mm -hmm. So every dot, every idea is given new weight, right? And we were conditioned to read the New Testament wrong, and we overcame it. So I'm not saying that this is a not an over something that can't be overcome. But the first thing is to realize that there's a problem, which we do. I'm preaching to choir today, but uh -huh. <laughs> that's true. So we're going to do some basic education stuff now, okay? So the USSR was trying to take over the country for political power, and most charlatans are trying to deceive people for monetary gain, right? Satan is trying to deceive people to undermine Yahweh's plan of salvation for mankind. Now, this is a different plane of existence that we're talking about here. So, um, I think I have a nifty slide here. It really doesn't mean anything, but we don't have to look at this Russian dude anymore. So, so there's, there's differences here in sciences. There's expectations. When we have a basic Western education has, has effectively been lost, right? You know, that, that comrade dude was talking about how it would take 15 years, right? But now we're wondering, why is it that kids lack the ability to critically think? They don't have the basic English and mathematics, and they don't have basic uh, uh, critical thinking skills. They just don't have it, right? They just make decisions based on emotion. That's the answer out to the question I was asking before. How do you make decisions if you can't evaluate facts? You do it on feeling. You do it on attraction. You do it on emotion. Seldom does that work out well. Well, in the scriptures, is it exact opposite of that? There's not a lot of emotion. It's more black and white. 
factual action. There's less emotion attached. Mostly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would say. But there still is some in the New there Testament. Is. Yeah, yeah. So so there's two competing things here is that we have the pure sciences, which are physics, engineering, uh, uh, electricity, mechanics. Those are on the right. Those are those are things where you can actually quantify and test. So if you have a jar of mayonnaise that says it has 12 ounces of mayonnaise in it, you could empty that jar and put the substance in another vessel that like a graduated cylinder and say, oh, yep, it really does. That's testable, right? That's not theology. Theology, sociology, anthropology, history, these are on the left side here. And they're randomly on the left side. They don't, there's no meaning to them being on one side, either side, right? Is, is that there, there's a totally different set of standards for believing something when you talk about the social sciences. The faith that what's delivered is not something that can be completely quantified. Uh, uh, Tiffany was just going to where, where I was, going again, always. Right the right there. <laughs> always like, like a chess player, always two moves ahead. We're not working with transistors that can be forward biased. We're not looking at Boolean algebraic strings that if whatever we give an input, we're going to get the same quantifiable output. We're looking at something that we have to look have to, to, to look at in, in pieces and make judgments about the behavior of mankind and that the behaviors. It's not a, a precise uh, methodology. Is that there? Sure. Yeah, measurement. So it's anthropology, history, archaeology, and the like. They all provide information that we then compile and reference against our Bibles. Right? Aren't we all just gleeful every time they find some new thing in the Middle East? And we always try to figure out which book of the Bible it lines up with, right? Because we we trust the Bible as our foundation, which which is our basis of, of knowledge. And it used to be the basis of knowledge for Western society. We used to be raised to learn how to read so we could read the Bible, right? Same reason that Jews learned how to read, so they could read the Torah, right? We've divorced religion from society completely, so now we're just learning for the sake of, of learning, which I guess works out. But absolute truth does exist within social sciences, it's just that the overall grouping is broad. So when we say that, that, that as I'm going to use Christmas as an example later, when we say Christmas is pagan, there isn't a moment in time where somebody took a knife switch in a laboratory and said, oh, right, we're, we're, we're going to paganism now. These things happen over large periods of time, and they get... And societies change over large periods of time. Well, and different aspects and cultures have brought into that and it adapted with other countries. So it's it's a hodgepodge of so many cultures into one yeah. celebration. Right. So it's very difficult to pay, very difficult to quantify exactly when it happened and who did what. Mm -hmm. But it is what it is, right? And so... Uh, within the social sciences, the Ten Commandments are absolutes, right? The death and resurrection of the Messiah is an absolute. That's a truth that we can measure and quantify through witnesses and through testimony. But in reality, most of the doctrines that we hold, primary doctrines, are absolutes, right? We have a great deal of surety about things that we believe, right? Uh, you know, one of the big ones is creation. Well, we're all creationists, right? I don't believe the planet was was created. That it's not an accident. I mean, we're here. <laughs> we were created by something. Exactly, yeah. right? So that that's pretty. We that's can one, measure that. Yeah. So I think that's something our forefathers would call self-evident. Yes. Right. That you don't really need to do a lot of research. Look around. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. You guys online want to talk too? Just unmute and talk. Yeah, I shouldn't be only on talking. Yeah, that's what he's saying. We could call it the Chris and <laughs> Tiffany show. I think that's what's coming too. It's okay. The Apprentice. I'm keep running. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, hope you guys can hear the banter in the room. 
They couldn't hear it. I was talking too long. But, but when we start making, so there's a saying that says, God said it, I believe it, and that's of it. When you're on the doctrine trail and you read the Bible and you start believing it, if you have to be proven that the Sabbath is true, or you have to be proven that something that the Bible that the Bible absolutely says that we have to do, then you are making yourself out to be God. Well, part of that is when you feel like you've been led astray all these years, you don't believe anything until you're proven otherwise. So also is is the seventh day Saturday. What made the seventh day Saturday? So that comes into a whole nother, okay, Sabbath Saturday. Why is it Saturday? So, I mean, you have other questions come up as you're studying, you know. So, right. yeah, it says seventh day, but what makes the seventh day? And you got to do that research. So. so there's a line, though. There's a line to say that you're proving things so that you can be sure that your worship is holy. Mm-hmm. And then there's the when you cross the line to where everything has to be proven to you 100% correct, and you're making yourself out to be a judge. That's what I'm talking about. When you're making yourself out to be, we are to be a God, right? Yeah, we are. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, so when, <laughs> <laughs> moving on to the absolute sciences, okay? Now the absolute the absolute sciences the the pure sciences that's where I've spent most of my career and back in the day I used to kind of cross the streams and bring this up I think I will I have a really cool one on let there be light that you guys almost got today but I lost my tools I have a tool to break light into its now I have the prism I don't have the grating so I can break light into its wavelengths and show you guys the rain you know? oh the chat all right. So, uh, are we all being a judge or are we testing all things to see if they're true? So, yeah, yeah, Ross, that's the, that's the dividing line. If we're testing all things to see if they are true to count, to get ourselves right with the Lord, we're in the right aspect. If we're being a judge, we're not. And that's kind of the line that I'm talking about. When people want to be, want to be proven so much, the beyond a shadow of a doubt type stuff. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Oh. Um, and so in the absolute sciences is where I, I make my living. There is still no such thing as perfection. Even though we can test and test and test. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, in the Six Sigma method, the Six Sigma is one of the big quality systems that you study, right? 3.4 errors per million is considered statistical perfection. So if you make a process of, of a, a stamping machine that's going to take metal and stamp it into something else, if it fails three times in a million, in the pure sciences, that's considered perfect. Even though there's errors, it's still considered perfect because perfection is not attainable. Right. So we have calibration standards for physical dimensions with manufacturing, electricity with voltage and resistance, speed, velocity, temperature, uh, quantifying elements and aqueous solutions. I did that for five or six years where you were trying to find um, you know, lead, arsenic, selenium, thallium elements off the periodic table in, in solution, you could buy a standard from Fisher Scientific that has 10, million, 10 parts per million of uh, nickel in solution, and then you would dilute that down to test your machine, right? So I spent, I spent most of my life doing stuff like that. I used to drive around Southern California and calibrate metrology equipment for measuring manufacturing with this piece of glass in my car. This piece of glass uh, with chrome shapes on it, circles and triangles and squares. And this thing was traceable to NIST, MilSpec, and ANSI. It was a $5,000 piece of glass. And I would go and put it on a machine and set it up and tell it to measure. And if the machine gave me the wrong answer, 
my standard was the right answer and I would go turn resistors and and make adjustments or maybe knock on some bearings or something and get the thing to be accurate. Because when I left, they would use that to measure, I think one of the big things at the time were cell phone batteries. Like your cell phone battery was made in one place and the cell phone was made in another. So they'd have these drawings that we'd input into the machine to make sure that the the battery would snap together, right? You'd have just automatic measuring type stuff. So lots of time with engineering and testing and testing wavelengths and testing all these different things. But there's always error. There's always a window. Now, you can get the window really small. It depends on how much money you want to spend, right? There are standards that are incredibly accurate that you can calibrate and build machines to, but you better show up with 55-gallon drums of of $100 bills, right? Right? You are going to spend an enormous amount of money to get that to happen, okay? But even still, there's always slop. There's always an error. And then when you're in, when you're doing a manufacturing of, of, of goods, there's stacking of tolerances. So if you're supposed to build something that's within point, you know, within two microns, and the next component is within two microns, if everybody's on the plus side, by the time you're done, you end up plus, you know, 10 microns, so that engineers would build with that in mind. That's how they would establish their stuff. This is hurting my head. Okay. This is why I went to customer service. All right. All right. <laughs> so the, well, the, point yeah. is, the point is that perfection is not achievable. But you can get a good idea. You can get close. You can get close, yeah. right? It's not achievable. So we bring it in with secondary biblical doctors, because when I first came to the faith, I was heavy in all this engineering, and I was looking at it just like you were saying. Black and white, Bible's a tech manual, what it says I do, done. And it worked, except it was cold. It was an engineered faith. It didn't have emotion. It was a Vulcan, like, right? You were like a Pharisee? No, it wasn't a fair, I guess in some aspects, I was pretty dogmatic, yeah, but it was, it was very robotic, right? And Did you leave Yeshua out of it? (laughs) So when we bring in secondary biblical doctrines or historical concepts, we need to come to the conclusion, uh, or or if we need to come to the conclusion on a doctrine that the Bible doesn't talk about, Right. Does the Bible say anything about smoking weed? Not a word, right? Not a peep, right? But... You talk to people who believe it, that they probably find something in the Bible. Oh, I've seen some fool put up that all the green grass is for us to consume. (laughs) (laughs) Right? But, But no, but we can figure out from other scriptures that we're not supposed to be intoxicated. And we can figure well, out. Let's say that. Yeah, and we, and we can figure out from societies that having such a lifestyle creates opportunities for sin. So I you, think it's the alternate of the brain, because then you have lack. Of, you don't have a clear mind to make rational decisions. So that's <laughs> part of being intoxicated. Mm-hmm. When you're high on weed, you're not really fully with it. Okay. And then, you know, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. That would be something you could apply to weed. You know, if it causes you to sin, you have to cut off. Smoking. Well, are they sinning, though? The, the Bible doesn't say they're sinning, though. That's the thing. And but, cutting I mean, off your hand is, like, more like... Did you kill someone? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like murdering or... Stealing. stealing. Adultery, still, Yeah, something that it relates to that. But smoking weed... Isn't necessary against the scriptures. No, it's not. But if you if you smoke weed oh, and when high. you're high, you sin. Do you yeah. sin though? Do well, we all sin, but more along the line of if it directly causes okay. you to sin. So, so the point was, <laughs> not that we have to get outside the Bible to look at stuff, and we we need to um, Is that do gray research. Area? And cut, yeah, I okay. introduced gray area mm-hmm. right to the gray matter. Um, and then uh, when we're looking at doctrines that are hard, that, that maybe are, are contrary scriptures, right? 
you, you load up all the verses pro and all the verses against, and you start looking at Hebrew, and you start looking at Greek, and maybe you start looking at commentaries, right, to formulate these things. But you understand that you can come to a conclusion that might not be 100%. It might be 80%. Yeah. And you're like, I understand there's 20% I didn't get, but 80% is good enough, right? Well, well the next person next to you may not agree with that 80%. Because it's a gray area. They can interpret it differently. Well, what, they, what usually happens is they focus on the gray area because they don't want to change. They true. want the Bible to be silenced for, for whatever reason, right? Mm -hmm. Now, theology is a social science because it has to couple in all of these different aspects of you know, what did they dig up at Qumran? What did they dig up in ancient Samaria? What did they... What documents do we have from the Roman Empire, right? So we can look at all these things, and and as you get further from the Bible, you have less and less authority as to why you're looking at it, right? Because looking at historical records to formulate your opinion on the Bible, it should be the other way around, right? The Bible formulates your opinion on, on other matters. But what I'm saying is that you can do this. It's an okay thing. As we just keep it in into its uh, context, you can look at the Talmud. I, there are some people who are just like, if they hear the word Talmud, they just lose it. I like, go read it. Just you can. There's a website, sephariah.org. You can click on a verse, and it'll show you the rabbi's commentary. You're not really going to disagree with it, right? <laughs> it's usually the same conclusion that we come up to, right? It's obviously when you get to the fringes and the strange stuff that that's where you're like, oh, I ain't listening to that guy, right? But most of the time, if you look up the Sabbath, if you look up the holy days, if you look up verses about the temple and you click on what these other guys wrote, it's just like looking up a Matthew Henry commentary or looking up some other person's thoughts, right? It's not, don't treat it like it's a holy book. It's not scriptural. Right? It's not it's scriptural. It's from scriptures. Yeah, it's commentary on the yeah. scriptures. Yeah. Um, you can look at the early church fathers. You can look at the Catholic catechism. Sometimes you look at references to see, you look up the wrong, so, something that you know is wrong, and you're like, okay, I know that's wrong. How did they get there? What because you can get back to history to when this idea got introduced into the faith, right? Part of this is a, a guy named Valentinian, Valentinus, whatever his full name is. He was a third or fourth century early church father who had some pretty nifty ideas that turned into Calvinism because Calvin found this guy's writings and kablam brought Calvinism on, but it was somebody else had the idea first. And you can look and see where do these crazy ideas come from because so many people believe something, you might be like, well, let's find out why, right? And so all well, these references are also snapshots in time where people have put their own thoughts down about things. There's value, but they're not absolutes. We have to look at Bible history plus Bible, history, anthropology to formulate doctrines. And sometimes, and there's a scale of quantifiable data. This is more academia, right? When you're in the pure sciences, that's called um, quantitative data. Quantitative data is when you set the caption in English. Que vas a hacer ahora? I said, what are you going to do now in Spanish? Uh, <laughs> So, uh, so in the in in the absolute science sciences, it's called quantitative data because you can put a number to it and get the same result, give or take every time. Semi quantitative data means that you can get an idea. This is where polling data comes in. When they go out and poll three thousand people and they ask them the same questions, and then they say, "Okay, the the country believes this way." Well, they only talk to 3,000 people. So this, this is more of that Six Sigma stuff where you can do a sampling and then you can ask the questions in a certain way to come up with an idea of what a population thinks about an issue. 
And it's a big variance on that data. Qualitative data is more like there is water in the glass. You don't know how much of the water, you don't, it's qualitative, just means like a yes or no type thing. So, um, I mentioned at the beginning that we have forces at work undermining our educational institutions. And some of these forces are man-made and Satan is messing with us. Having a clear handle on reality is becoming a chore. It's becoming difficult to do that. So we have to put our knowledge together, and we also have to introduce the Holy Spirit, right? The Spirit's going to guide us into all truth. And it's gonna, you're going to get a feeling, after you've read the Bible, you're going to have a feeling if something's off. Follow the feeling, right? Because we do have a supernatural uh, working with us, right? We do have the Holy Spirit. It does exist. And when you have read the Bible cover to cover, you have a foundation with which to judge everything, right? That's it. That's our foundation. And once you've read the Bible and you've accepted Yeshua as the Messiah, you've welcomed the Holy Spirit into your life, you're not stuck on your own. And most of the, what I was talking about today was us doing it on our own. But think about how accurate do you really need to be, right? We, not for you yourself, it's up to you. Right? When I go to talk about it and put it out there on the internet, better be pretty good. You're right? Accountable. Right? <laughs> better be pretty good. I strive for 100%, but 100%. Yeah. Right, because there's always slop. But the Septuagint and the Masoretic text, this is something where this was the, what set me off on this was last week where somebody was saying there's no source data on Christmas being pagan, which is an absurd statement. It's just stupid, okay? Who I don't know who would say such a thing, right? <laughs> but, 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 but this is not isolated to that individual. Did you the Jews that I know that I've learned from the Jewish Messianic Jews? They or are come into contact with. They reject the Septuagint because the Septuagint is. The Hebrew Bible translated into Greek 200 years before Yeshua. It's the oldest and most authoritative text we have, okay? But they reject it because it's Greek. They said that they will, they don't have to believe it because there's, they don't have the Hebrew source data, right? But then they accept the Masoretic text, which is 1,000 years younger than the Septuagint, right? Well, here's the thing is if you look at it, both of them, right, which we have done over the years, we went through one year and did the Torah portions on the Septuagint instead of the regular Bible, they don't really, there's no variation, right? There's some variation in years and timings and stuff, right? But not that much at all, right? It's pretty tight. So when you demand it, you're, you're a lot of times people are saying, you know, they want to do something else. They want to believe something else. But in the case of the Septuagint, we can literally say, if it was good enough for the apostles, it's good enough for me. Because the Septuagint is the basis for the New Testament. It was, the first New Testament was based on, the first whole Bible was based on the Septuagint plus the New Testament in the Greek. So, I'm going to try to wrap it up because I'm, this is going forever, but. I've heard it said that there's no source data on Christmas. Now we're going to do practical. This is a practical application of, of the Bible. Assume you have read the Bible cover to cover and you have never seen Christmas in your life. That you lived somewhere that lived the Bible. Okay? And you walked into a country and you saw Christmas. You would be like, what's this? And people would tell you, we're observing the birth of the Son of God. You, having read the Bible, would know that that data is not in the Bible. When the Messiah was born is not in the Bible. There are no commanded festivals in the middle of winter. And so you would go and say that, no, they must be observing a day to their son of God, not mine. 
without any source data, without any anything other than the Bible, you can figure out that that celebration is a different religion pretty easily, right? If they're putting trees in their house, you have the book of Jeremiah. It's talking about idolatry, but golly, putting tinsel on a tree looks a lot like what Jeremiah was saying, right? You can't apply the Bible that way, right? Paul says you don't muzzle an ox while it's threshing equals a minister can be paid, which means if you can apply what Jeremiah is saying to something that's not exactly the same and say, I'm not going to do that. So without any source data whatsoever, you would see people doing midnight mass, exchanging presents under a tree, um, you know, all the accoutrement that go on with this thing, you know that has nothing to do with the Bible. So you don't need source data to say, I'm not doing that, right? But if you did want to look at source data, right, let's just say somebody tried to convince you that it is biblical because that's what they try to do. You could go and look in history. And the source data says, we know Yeshua's birth date is not recorded. That is source data, okay? Doesn't exist. We know when December 25th was chosen for his birth and who did it. It was Pope Julius I. He did it when he was a pope between 337 and 352 AD. We know who did it and we know when they did it. And they did it because it's not, he was born around March 25th and nine months later would have been December 25th. You mean conceived? Conceived, yeah. Okay. We do know, um, if we do some serious study, that he wasn't probably, that he was probably born in the fall. Okay? But we can't conclude the data from Scripture. This is called semi-quant. We can get pretty close. We know if his birth had been recorded, it would have been recorded on a Hebrew calendar. It would not have been recorded on a Gregorian calendar, right? We know the Romans had a pagan celebration in wintertime that mirrors the 12 days of Christmas. Okay, we know that. That's not a made-up thing. That's pure. There's volumes of, the, of, of data on the Saturnalia. We know that they ran chariot races. We know we had that they had the upside-down day where for 24 hours the rich people became poor and the poor people became rich and debauchery about it. Everybody was equal at that time. Yeah. 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 We, we know all of these practices about the mistletoe. We know that um, the mistletoe and the Yule log were homosexually uh, uh, related things. It, we just know it, right? It's a, it's, it's a, well, you got Time is the Ally of Deceit over there. The other book has the yellow version of that has the same information in it. And, and we have Pat Robertson admitting it. The tree was actually the Germans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, the evergreen tree came later from the Germans, mm -hmm. right? But the Yule log and the mistletoe were the older ones. Mm -hmm. But the list goes on and on and on. So the pattern I was showing there is walking our faith out. Is 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 the the practical, right? In the practical, do you need source data to figure out that something isn't of Yahweh? No, because you know what is of Yahweh, right? And so you don't need, but if you wanted source data to figure out how it happened, you could. Now, if you walked into a country and they're fixing to have a parade, and you go, what's the parade for? Oh, we're celebrating our Independence Day. Not wrong with that, right? <laughs> you can just enjoy the parade, right? You're not going to, you're not breaking any commandment by having a religious, having a non religious observance. Or just enjoying a snow cone with some people who are having a good time, right? Well, it's a memory of that country and their freedom yeah. versus a religious or a goddess or some paganistic right. yeah. god. Yeah, there's celebration and then there's observance. Yeah. So if, so if it's not, if it's a secular thing, the, we have judgments that we can make, right? But my sterile faith, when I came at this from the engineering perspective, was we were only going to do the Sabbath and nothing else. Well, a lot of people and, do that. They only do the feast of the scriptures and nothing else. Right. And that's okay. You can do it that way. Or there's nothing wrong with doing some of the worldly celebrations. Because, like, the point with the guy that you're talking about, he was saying they had other celebrations that were not in feast. 
there were other celebrations like Hanukkah that aren't part of the feast that they celebrated or acknowledged that won't condone or condemn. They just were. So yeah, right. And so it's so it's not so there's a dividing line there, but. Mm -hmm. Um, the pattern I show is just, just how to walk our faith out. And reading the Bible from cover to cover in a normal translation that you can understand is, is the way to avoid the deception. Right? That's it. Right? As a, as a little kid would say, welcome Jesus into your heart. Right? You have to get to know Yahweh. You got to get to know Yeshua. Come with a childlike heart. <laughs> right. Come like a child. Read the Bible and trust the Holy Spirit. And it's going to it's going to show us all truth, which if this button works, we will actually see that. You know, an hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And so we have, as Dan was saying last Friday, that... We have the truth now. We're good on that. We're really good on that. Jots and tittles and such like that. The spirit part, sometimes we lack because we're because our way, our people in our walk are heavy on truth or and inside. light on spirit. But I have to tell you, when people tell me, you God told me, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. There's a line right. of scripture. Right. Right, right, okay, right, and I'm just a skeptical on that type of stuff because when you get into that, you to me it's a, it's a very risky. I just am wary of it. Mm -hmm. But just having much knowledge though is not the maturity of the faith. The maturity of the faith is the knowledge, the spirit, and the experience. Right, we who've walked it out for a while have matured in our faith to be able to deal with situations in in a better way than we did when we were new, right? When we were new, it was like like you're cleaning out your bin. This is out, this is in. This is out, no. this is in. No. <laughs> yeah. But now we can kind of understand some of the gray area. And the rubber has to meet the road. we got to realize, for me, I had to realize that the Bible was not written by engineers or for engineers. It was written by people who had hearts and emotions and lives and experiences and had to run from the Romans and flee King Herod. And, you know, all of these it, these things actually happened to human beings who then wrote them down years later. And they didn't write down a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. And so we have, have to understand that as well. The information in the Bible, particularly the New Testament, was meant to be digested by the entire world, not necessarily just the engineering mindset people. The early believers, you know, heard the word, repented, got baptized, and went and heard Moses. And over a long period of time, they had to get with the program. And so it also takes a lot of time. But for us Gentiles to really learn Moses, we need our minds, the Holy Spirit, and our experiences. And sometimes source data. So, I have rambled. <laughs> That's where you say amen, huh, honey? <laughs> Is anybody coming to come off? <laughs> Gonna come off, Mike? They're awake. They're all awake. I can see them. I don't know. Ross is sitting still. He might have put up a, a, a background of himself. There he is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> What's up, Everett? Yeah, I have a little comment. Uh, you know, appreciate what you have to say. Uh, there, there's one thing that uh, I kind of relied on uh, when trying to make a decision one way or another about various things, uh, and that is love your neighbor as yourself. That uh, when put and and of course before that. Um, have no other gods before you, but uh, often it's become when I've had a decision I've had to make, you know, well, is it this way or is it this way? Uh, that's kind of been the dividing factor, or the, uh, the tipping of the evidence is, am I really 
concerned about my neighbor or am I concerned about myself? And do I want to honor God or do I want to take care of myself? And that's been a big help. All right. I don't see anybody else. All right. Well, we will wrap it up then. <laughs>